Thank you very much. Just as you're taking a seat, I'll quickly introduce uh, the next session. Uh, as you know, we've, we've had a bit of a comprehensive introduction to uh, the topic. And what we're going to do in this next section is to very much focus on uh, path pathways to, to therapy. I'd, I'd like to invite uh, three of the four speakers to come up and, and join me on the podium here. Uh, Luke Bolter from the University of Edinburgh, Lizzie Smythe from uh, the Royal Marsden in London, and Sumira Rizvi from the uh, Mayo Clinic. Um, Lipika will, will join us uh, a little bit later on. In this session, we're going to cover the WIND pathway initially, uh, followed by the FGFR pathway, and uh, it's congratulations to um, two of the grantees from last year's uh, round of grant applications uh, who will be talking specifically about FGFR pathway and therapeutic resistance, as well as a HIPPO and FGFR autocrine pathway in cholangiocarcinoma. So without further ado, I want to hand you over to uh, Luke Bolter, our first speaker. Super. Thank you very much. And can I start by thanking the organizers for flying me over from Edinburgh to come and speak with you today? So um, we'll get straight on with it. Um, some declarations. But my lab looks at the wind signaling pathway. So the wind signaling pathway has historically always been seen as existing in these two states, kind of on and off. And what happens essentially is that you've got these two receptors, frizzled and LRP, which bind to one another to translocate a signal through into the nucleus by stabilizing beta catenin. It's a very, very straightforward pathway in many ways, but recently uh, a large amount of evidence um, from uh, a number of labs, both here and in Europe, have shown that there's a level of complexity at the, uh, the receptor, uh, which um, allows for very, very fine-tuned regulation of this signaling cascade. So we've looked at this in a number of uh, homeostatic and uh, regenerative contexts, and we became interested in cholangiocarcinoma, particularly on the background of that. So one of the key things that I'd like to people to take home is that actually this is a signal that drives tumors, to, uh, drives cells rather, to divide and uh, tumors to grow. So that was all well and good. It was a great hypothesis based on the fact that in colorectal cancer, 70% of patients have a mutation in APC, one of these core proteins in this um, wind signaling pathway. Um, in 20% or so of HCC, beta catenin is mutated, so it's hyperactivated. And then um, these two exome sequencing studies were published, and that completely blew our hypothesis apart, because one of the things that really surprised us compared to other gastrointestinal and hepatic tumors was that there really wasn't any evidence of beta catenin activating mutations or indeed APC mutations. So there aren't these core mutations in the center of the pathway that exist in other tumors. Something that we should kind of point out is that, oops, how do I go back, there we go, was that, as mentioned already, RNF43, um, this E3 ligase that turns over the frizzle receptor is mutated in about 9% of cases. So that then led us into what we think was quite an exciting hypothesis, that actually in these tumors, the wind signaling cascade is intact, and that what you're getting is not activation of this signaling cascade through mutational events, but through ligand addiction and through hyperstimulation of these pathways. So whilst targeting mutations and pathways that are activated as a consequence of those mutations is, of course, important, we think actually you can get a lot of information from the transcription and um, from the mRNAs that are synthesized. And we looked at a number of cholangiocarcinomas um, and distal non-cancerous tissue from the same patient and found that um, there was a large upregulation of the uh, canonical wnt signaling pathway. Importantly as well, we see upregulation of WNT7B, uh, which I'm heartened to see is also featured on a poster um, in the poster hall, and um, also went 10 a We also showed that actually in the vast majority of cases we looked at, so this is looking at about 75 cholangiocarcinomas compared to a patient match tissue that isn't cancerous, we saw an increase in uh, beta catenin signaling, so WNT signaling. And that was very important because this shows that actually this pathway is going and it is activated despite the lack of canonical mutations. So we then, to confirm this, um, looked at the number of downstream candidates. So things that are known to be transcribed as a result of beta catenin moving into the nucleus, uh, cyclin D2, LEF1, survivin, MIC, and SOX9. 
And what we found in all cases was that for these five markers, the um, amount of nuclear staining, or in mixed case, just staining, is upregulated in the uh, cancer versus the distal non-cancer liver. So I hope I'm convincing you that there's a body of evidence that actually this pathway might be important. So you heard in the previous session about some of the excellent um, animal models that have been developed. And our small contribution to the field was developing this keratin-19-driven uh, P53 knockout where we simultaneously tagged uh, the pre-malignant CK19 positive cells, so the bile ducts, the, cancer, the cholangiocytes, with um, YFP. And what we did was, following knockout, we uh, gave thiacetamide for 26 weeks, and we could find some really quite nice yellow tumors. Um, what we saw, of course, was that in those yellow tumors, um, we see translocation of beta catenin into the nucleus, but actually in cells that are yet YFP positive, so have recombined P53, but haven't then gone on to develop tumors, so haven't got a second genetic hit, presumably, um, those don't have any nuclear beta catenin. So we really think that activation of the WIMP pathway, or the, the canonical WIMP pathway at least, is important in this transition from a normal healthy bile duct into something that's cancerous. And again, just to over -egg the pudding completely, um, we see active beta catenin, LEF1, cycling D2, SOX9, and MYC in this mouse model. So we think that this does recapitulate what we see in the human disease. We've heard already this morning quite a lot that these mutations that we get in cholangiocarcinoma are quite heterogeneous. And actually, we were slightly uncomfortable just using P53 knockout to model our studies because actually that only represents 18% of um, mutations found in cholangio. So we then kind of went on to a slightly more variable model of bile duct cancer. And that's actually still using thiacetamide. But instead of giving it to mice where we've taken out a gene, we give it to wild type uh, rats. So these are tumors that are spontaneously arising and so presumably have um, a more variable complement of genetic um, mutations. What was quite nice in this is that we can map this over time. So we, we gave thiacetamide and you can see beta catenin here. So beta catenin is in the membrane and then when it's activated, it goes into the nucleus. So the nucleus here is in blue. Uh, so in the precancerous disease, we see very little nuclear beta catenin in all of these cells. So these are really, really quite injured livers. They're highly reactive, and these are non-cancers. However, when these transition into cancer at around 19 to 21 weeks, we start to see in these small foci the translocation of beta catenin into the um, nucleus. And again, these are quite heavily established cancers by this point, and they're packed to the gunnels with nuclear beta catenin. Interestingly as well, this kind of in goes uh, in line with known targets, and we've heard a bit about Ospondin and the uh, Ospondin fusions. Um, but here, uh, we see lots of WIMP targets going up um, as the tumors evolve, so between weeks probably about 19 and 21, and then up as they grow um, linearly. What was quite nice in this, we thought, was that actually WIMP 10A, which we'd identified from the human tissue earlier, um, goes up very early. So we think this is probably more of a regenerative WIMP ligand, whereas WIMP 7B, the other ligand we identified from the human tissue correlates with the uh, emergence and then lo linear growth of the cancers. And we kind of came at this from a slightly weird uh, macrophage-based background because we've always been interested in how macrophages produce wints in various regenerative and cancerous contexts. And uh, so what we did was we took um, bone marrow from a GFP-expressing rat, put it into a wild-type rat, and then gave those rats um, thiacetamide to give them cancer. And what we found was actually a large component of the um, stroma, so which we heard about before uh, from Katie, is um, GFP positive. So that says to us that these macrophages, these inflammatory cells, are not being um, derived from the resident tissue macrophages, but actually are coming from the bone marrow. And in these, um, these uh, bone marrow-derived macrophages, about kind of 20% or so are expressing WINT7B. So what do you do? You've got a set of cells that are expressing WINT7B. You presume that they're driving the cancer to grow. We've shown that the pathway is probably important. Also, we took this option of kind of deleting the macrophages, and we used a fairly dirty method um, and then a slightly more clean method. So our dirty method, um, which I'll talk about because it's 
um, done in the rat um, was to use liposomal clodronate. So liposomal clodronate is phagocytosed by macrophages uh, where it bioaccumulates and then it's cytotoxic. So it kills these um, inflammatory cells. And what we were able to do is give cancer. So this, these tumors are established, these cholangiocarcinomas are there. And then we deleted macrophages with liposomal clodronate. And you can see that what we managed to do was decrease the total tumor area by about 75% and also significantly decrease the number of tumors that formed within these um, livers. So not only do we um, shrink them, but also the small tumors that have formed early on, if we take away the macrophages, they just fall apart. And when we took out those, uh, those, sorry, those um, tumors, we were able to see that actually the Wnt pathway is downregulated when we lose macrophages. It wouldn't be great to take liposomal clodronate. It's fairly dirty. So we repeated this um, experiment with a uh, CSR receptor 1, CSF receptor 1 inhibitor, um, and found pretty similar things. But I, I won't talk about that particularly. The thing we've been most interested in, however, is whether we can target this pathway therapeutically. And as Andrew said earlier, this has been fraught in many, many different tumors, uh, with off-target effects particularly. Um, however, there is a new generation of um, therapeutic Wnt inhibitors, which I think are pretty good, and are pretty good particularly if you have an intact Wnt pathway and if that Wnt pathway is hyperactivated. So we've used two of these inhibitors. We've used um, ICG-001 and an earlier variant of LGK-974 called Wnt-C59. And we asked the question, can we just remove the Wnt signal, and does that have an effect on Bardot cancer? So the first thing we did was uh, we went to some cell lines. If we were doing this now, we have some nice tumor organoids that we could use, but this was a few years ago, so we had 2D cell lines. Um, and we looked at four different cell lines, um, and sorry, five different cell lines. Um, and the, the data is kind of summarized here. You don't need to see what this says in particular, but the long and short of it is when we give Wnt inhibitor, um, so either C59 or ICG001, um, we get downregulation of the canonical Wnt pathway. Uh, so this is target gene expression, which is unsurprising. So in green, um, we managed to increase the level of apoptosis in these cell lines whilst also decreasing proliferation. And again, we went back into the rat. So this is where the rat, I think, is a really strong model for looking at cholangiocarcinoma because we have a diverse mutational profile. Uh, it's got a really good stroma. It's got a really lovely kind of cancerous epithelium. Uh, so actually, it really recapitulates a lot of the things that we see in the patient um, tumors. So we gave um, our two experimental compounds, C59 and ICG, and again, we're able to reduce tumor number and also tumor size um, using both inhibitors. That's using those inhibitors as a single agent. So the thing to kind of take away from this is that the canonical wind signaling pathway is um, highly activated in CCA but may not be mutated, that the macrophages that arise from the bone marrow and kind of infiltrate into the tumor are probably producing a lot of this ligand or at least are initiating a cascade of events that allows this pathway to become activated um, and that actually you can delete macrophages to remove your ligand source or you can um, target the wind signaling pathway therapeutically and that has an effect. The one thing we did always see was that this was not a cure for the cholangiocarcinomas in our rat model. Um, and so this kind of uh, bothered us slightly. Because what we thought was actually these rats should all respond quite well to this drug, and they should all re react to it in a re fairly uniform way. But actually what we found, and what we find in many, many clinical trials, is you get good responders and poor responders. So here, just as an example with the ICG-001, we have three rats, actually, in which the tumors were completely cleared. And we, t we look at the entire liver. So it's a really quite comprehensive analysis. And this is a pathologist looking at this, not just me with my kind of amateur eyes. Um, whereas actually there was a group of rats in which tumors were still present. So we have taken two different uh, routes to trying to understand this. The first I won't talk about, and that's to understand how the genetics of these uh, residual tumors allows their survival in the presence of Wnt inhibitor. Um, and that's work ongoing. And the second one was to ask, well, can we just, very, in a very, very simple way, combine a Wnt inhibitor with chemotherapy and try and reduce the tumors even further? So 
This is some work done by Lucille Horot, who was a French student in my lab who is now back in France. And she started by looking at the TCGA data set. So she looked across all tumors at um, chemotherapeutic efflux pumps. So these are proteins that are expressed on the cell surface that drive chemotherapy out of the cell uh, so it can't confer its effect. Um, so what she found is actually in cholangiocarcinoma, there's a very, very high expression, higher than any other tumor of MRP3, which is this multi-drug resistance protein 3. And actually, if you then compare within cholangiocarcinoma, so this is TCAJ2 again, that um, ABCC3 or MRP3 is again very high compared to um, other known chemotherapeutic efflux pumps expressed in cholangiocarcinoma. And this is a cancerous duct. And here you can see on red, uh, in red rather, that the um, ABCC3 or MRP3 localizes to these cancerous bile ducts. So to try and understand whether actually WINT has an effect in regulating MRP3 or ABCC3, they're both the, it's both the same, two different names for the same thing. We uh, treated some cells, two cell lines, with um, a, an escalating dose of ICG001, which is this uh, small molecule inhibitor of beta-catenin CTBP. So we prevent any transcription um, through that axis. And what we found was that at the transcript level, uh, the with an escalating dose of ICG, the levels of MRP3 transcripts decrease in both of these intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma lines. And we also see at the protein level that actually at the higher concentrations, ABCC3 is lost, and actually quite a low concentration here um, in this LP line. Um, forgive the loading controls, they're pretty awful. Um, what we then did was we took this um, escalating dose study, but instead of escalating the um, dose of ICG, we had a fixed dose of ICG, um, which was previously published, and we escalated a dose of 5-fluorouracil. And what we found was that actually these cells were pretty tolerant to treatment with 5-FU. So 5-FU is a chemotherapy. Um, but actually, if we treat with um, ICG and then escalate the dose of 5-FU, these cells have become sensitized to chemotherapy. So we think we can combine, in cell culture at least, um, WINT inhibition with chemotherapy um, to improve, or, or to, to improve killing of the cancer cells. So we went back then to our rat model, um, you know, our model of choice, and we looked at MRP3 expression um, in vivo. And what we did was we uh, gave thiacetamide to rats again. At week 21, these rats um, developed tumors, and by week 26, those tumors are pretty big. And what we found over the time course was that actually MRP3 transcription um, or expression increases. We see actually the same with MRP1 as well. Um, and then when we give ICG or vehicle, uh, we see a reduction in the uh, mRNA level of, uh, of MRP3. What's quite interesting is this doesn't happen for MRP1. So we really think this is an MRP3 specific effect. MRP2 doesn't really go up. Um, and MDR1 or uh, ABCB1 um, is quite highly expressed throughout. Again, what we found was that this um, ABCC3 is expressed um, in the rat's cancers and has a slightly different localization in the, to, to when it's in cells. Um, we're not entirely sure why that is, maybe because the cells have um, adapted to kind of grow in vitro. Uh, but again, uh, when we give IC... Sorry, this was left one before, so to show that we've got effective wind inhibition. Uh, but when we give uh, ICG001, uh, we see downregulation of MRP3. So again, we think this kind of MRP3 is a responsive gene in vivo. Um, and so we put together what was, um, I suppose, a kind of rat equivalent of a double-blind trial. Um, and so we had uh, mice that had received 26 weeks of diacetamide. So they all had d um, advanced cancers by this point. They were then randomized into two groups. The first group received ICG001. Uh, this has been submitted, so hopefully it will be accepted. Um, and uh, the second group received a vehicle for ICG for five weeks. These were then re-randomized and so got five fluorouracil or vehicle again. And what we found was that in the five fluorouracil alone, uh, we got 
not really any reduction reduction in axin, unsurprisingly, which is the Wnt target. Uh, similarly, um, LEF and MRP3 both Wnt targets. We didn't see much reduction in those. But actually, when we give so either ICG followed by vehicle or ICG followed by 5-FU, we see downregulation of canonical Wnt targets. And this is the outcome of uh, that study. So the tumors in these mice are uh, sorry in these rats are demarcated by these back lines, and so we have vehicle 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 5-FU, ICG 001 vehicle and ICG 001 5-FU. And what we found, I'm just trying to think which way to go. We'll get to the top first. So unsurprisingly, 5-FU on its own did very little. Um, the ICG on its own reduced tumor number. I should just say that this isn't as striking as when we gave ICG 001 before, but that's not a surprise given that uh, the, uh, we gave the Wnt inhibitor and then these had had five weeks essentially without anything else. So in the absence of giving the Wnt inhibitor, the cancers have probably regrown, is what we think is happening. Um, but actually, when we combine ICG-001 with 5-FU, then we get reduced tumor number and tumor size. So we were pretty chuffed with that. We thought that was um, really quite exciting. But what made it more exciting was that um, we see a reduction in liver-to-body weight ratio, so the, the livers are kind of appear a bit bigger and a bit healthier. Um, and then when we've done serum tests, uh, we actually see an improvement in the um, synthetic function of these livers when they've had um, ICG and chemotherapy, or actually um, ICG on their own compared to the two groups. So we are saying we think that this is through regulation of MRP. Um, and so uh, by reducing the levels of MRP expression in your tumor, you can sensitize that tumor to chemotherapy. Uh, which we thought was quite exciting. The other hypothesis, of course, is that ICG has shrunk your tumor, so you have a smaller tumor to start with. So when you give 5-FU, it's just more impacting because it can penetrate the tumor a bit better. Uh, we're not entirely sure which hypothesis is true at the moment. Um, now I had said that I would do a reasonably short talk so we can be on time. Um, so I hope that is short enough. Um, so the, uh, the second conclusion, really, from this is that... Um, we think using our Wnt inhibitors, at least these two therapeutic ones, uh, that we can sensitize cancers to 5-FU, uh, that, uh, that that combination can uh, allow further reduction of tumor load in vivo. And importantly, um, these two compounds, so C59 has been developed into LGK974. As you heard earlier, that's um, already in trial or be starting to be trialed. Um, ICG-001 has been developed into PRI-724, um, and we're working with a company to try and uh, bring that into an early phase trial for cholangiocarcinoma. So we also have a second project uh, looking at the genetics of chemo resistance and the genetics of uh, Wnt therapeutic resistance, uh, but I won't go into that today. Um, and this is my tiny lab. Um, looks like a bad boy band. But... Uh, <laughs> I would most like to um, thank the Leverhulme Trust. Um, I'm funded, co-funded by the MRC, um, but also, actually, without the AMMF, uh, which is uh, the, the British Glandiocarcinoma Charity, we really wouldn't have been able to do any of this work or, indeed, the work that we're uh, currently doing. So it really is credit to them for supporting this. Um, so I think I've got 17 minutes to go, but that's kind of brought us on time, I hope. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.